organizers for having this conference. I've never been to a chat um, uh, conference before, so I'm quite excited about this. Uh, but also for having it in, in Orkney, um, a nice rural setting, and for the conference organizers. Um, and this specific uh, session where we're talking about the experiences of rural landscapes. Um, and I come at this from both an interest in it in a research side of things, but also on a personal level. I am from um, a, quite a rural landscape in southwestern British Columbia, Canada. Um, and like, sim like many um, uh, rural landscapes, I think we're, we're experiencing you know, what happens when you have urban city dwellers, the Vancouverites, um, start to come down into uh, you know, our, our village, uh, which used to be very agricultural, and change what that uh, rural landscape looks like, um, and in, in turn, um, they're having to adjust to things like the smell of manure, um, which for some is quite traumatic. Um, so, um, also I want to thank, before I start, um, uh, thank the community members uh, from Nikitari Village in Cyprus, um, and uh, they've agreed to let me use some of the images of them and uh, stories um, that they've told me. So, um, to start off, rural in Cyprus um, as a tour, can be seen as a tourist product. It's certainly um, marketed as a tourist product. It's an alternative to the uh, the sun, sand, and sea um, options that many people come to, uh, to Cyprus to, um, to experience. And so it really, um, it's, it's marketed uh, often as this a place, it's a geographical location that you can go to have a certain kind of experience. Um, and the language used to describe this kind of experience is, you know, looking at traditional villages, you have kind of quaint painted churches, um, and forests, but there is this idea that the rural landscape is timeless, it doesn't change, um, and that's something uh, that we've, we've heard in this uh, session so far. So what I'm going to be looking at is really the forests, um, and uh, looking at forests in this rural context, and uh, perceptions of the forest in Cyprus. So, for you, those of you who don't know where Cyprus is, I'm sure everyone does, um, but you have to have a map. Um, so, Cyprus is the island smack dab in the middle of the eastern Mediterranean. And um, you can see on uh, this slide kind of what the forest looks like. Um, it's a pine forest um, for the most part. And the pine forest, um, or the, certainly the state forest, is really perceived as being this empty landscape. There's nothing really there. It's, it's tranquil, it's a great spot for a walk, have a picnic, things like that. But other than that, it's, it's really empty. Um, and what I'm going to argue today is that um, these perceptions of the forest as being empty really do emerge from um, uh, the, the colonization of the island by the British, um, uh, which started really uh, with their administration in 1878. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea of how the presentation is going to run, um, I'm going to start off by um, really talking about, as I said, perceptions of the forest. Um, I'm going to start talking about the historical context for that, um, which kind of comes down to the administration of the forest, or the administration of the island by the British, but especially the delimitation of the forest, or basically the construction of state forests by the British. Um, and then I'm going to go to a case study, um, again, working with this community of Nikitari, um, and looking at their perception of the forest and how different that is. So Cyprus, um, well, the administration of Cyprus was taken um, over by the British in, from the Ottoman um, Empire in 1878. And um, obviously this was for strategic reasons. <laughs> Cyprus is a great spot to be in control of, especially at that time. Um, uh, but in doing so, they really aimed to make um, Cyprus uh, into a, a model for good government in the East. And of course, underlying this is wonderful Orientalism. Um, so there's a thought that through um, the Ottoman uh, control of the island and its administration, they made Cyprus a little bit despotic, um, right? So you can see in, the, um, in some of the discussions of certainly the, the, the rural um, 
uh, people, or any Cypriot really, is thought of as being a bit backward, a bit slow, a bit lazy, sleepy. Um, and that, in, in fact, was kind of, they thought, was certainly perpetuated <coughs> by the Ottoman um, administration. So as part of this, um, the administration of uh, Cyprus, as um, we see in many other um, kind of colonies, you had uh, the dividing and ordering of the landscape. And of course, they did that through various um, means. They started off with a census, understanding what the population actually was composed of. Um, they did a wonderful maps, a map making program um, to understand what that landscape looked like. And they built some roads to make sure that you could access those kind of hinterland areas. But as part of this, they also made the, for the state forest and that was um, the delimitation of the forest. So in doing so, it was not just making the unknown known, but it was also making sure that it was a little bit more British than it had been before. So in 1881, the Forest Delimitation Commission um, imposed the forest, forest Delimitation Law, and what that meant was basically they wanted to make the state forest. Um, so what happened is when the British um, arrived to Cyprus, they really saw a different version of the forest than what they thought. I mean, this was the land of Aphrodite where you should have had you know, lush forests and, um, and it, it pristine and tranquil. And in fact, what they found was there was a lot of overgrazing of the forest by goats. Um, and there was a lot of um, overuse of the forest as they saw it being overused by the, the local population. And so as a result, they thought, okay, we have to stop this. Um, there's obviously economic reasons for doing this. They wanted to make sure that the forest was, um, uh, could sustain the British and, and their plans for it. But um, so what they did is they decided to create a state forest, okay? Um, and in doing so, what they did is they, they actually physically created um, the state force. They made this um, boundary, um, as I'm going to talk about in, the in a minute, between a lived landscape and an empty one. And you can see here um, on the right-hand side of the screen, this is uh, a masonry cairn. This is like a <coughs> physical cairn. It's about a meter tall. It was made, this is one of the original ones, um, made of stones, then covered with plaster and whitewashed. And you, this is a wonderful picture here, courtesy of Michael Gibbon. Um, and this is a boundary cairn here, and it's just in sight of a village. So what they were doing is they were dividing the cultivated land from the common land, what was classified as common land and uh, forest land. So that meant that villages like this one um, that I'm going to talk about, um, it's a bit fuzzy here, um, but you'll see there's a boundary all the way around this um, area. This is a, um, the village of Kartaruni. Um, it became an island within the forest through this marking of um, a boundary between the cultivated um, and uncultivated land. And you can see just in the distance here, there's a, a little, uh, a um, one of the village structures uh, from Kartaruni. So it was meant to be this boundary, these, these physical markers were really meant to be seen. Um, so that, you know, villagers, you look out your window and say, oh, okay, that's the marker where the state force starts. So that's where I'm not allowed to take my goats. That's where I'm not allowed to even gather dead wood anymore without a permit. So there's all these different rules. So it was really marking that landscape. Um, and Michael Gibbons done a lot of really good work um, from the University of Glasgow on the, the dynamics of that uh, <coughs> So this meant the villages that used to be um, happily using the forest, it was part of their lived landscape, um, now became very separate from it. And in time, eventually these um, villages were abandoned um, because they could no longer uh, access the forest, which is the reason why they were there in the first place. So in, in making this boundary, it was really creating this division between um, the lived landscape here, um, where Kartaruni village is, and even on this map, this is a cadastral plan that obviously just shows um, owned land. But 
within this area, you can see there, there's the remains of terraces, there's ovens, there's sheepfold, it's an active spot. But outside of that, the land is actually empty, it's been erased. And in fact, the only evidence for um, you know, past use of land comes from locality names, which is on uh, the map. And you probably can't see that very well, but they're the little, uh, the names in italics. And sometimes they will say, to provide information about how that landscape was used in the past. So it was objectifying this forest and um, into a spot that was considered empty. And that, as I'm going to argue is this, that perception, that view is really something that hasn't been changed up until today. So just to move uh, to the case study, um, these are some places that I'm going to be talking about on a wonderful Google Earth map. Um, so this is the village of Nikitari. Now, Nikitari village exists on pretty much the, the foothills of the plains. It's not within the state forest. Um, the state forest boundary really comes probably around this area here. This is again the Delphi State Forest, so it's just to the east of where Kartaruni um, we, we just looked at. This is the Church of Panea Forviotisa, which is a UNESCO listed church, and this is a, the village of Asini, which is currently abandoned. Now, the inhabitants of Nikitari village used to live in Asinu village. They, um, like Kartaruni, when the boundary, the state boundary um, of the felt forest was put into place, they could no longer use um, the lands, the, the forest as they did before. They were big goat herders in this area. Um, and after, even though there was lots of resistance, and there's great stories about this resistance, people taking their goats into the forest and getting fined for it and various things, even with that, eventually, they just, uh, come 1950s, 1960s, they, they finally, the last person left. Um, so a lot of the people who currently live in Nikitara used to live in this, um, in this village. And this is what it looks like today. You know, some mud brick buildings. Um, this is the church of Panea Forviotisa, also called the Sinu church. It has all sorts of different names depending on the transliteration. And Nikitari village is right between these mountains here. But even though the forest is being considered as being empty by many, um, the inhabitants of Nikitari still have a deep connection to that, um, to that forest. And in fact, it really is still part of their <coughs> landscape. And um, in this image on the top left, um, this is a, an elder, Paniotos <coughs> Lopas. And he was, he's sitting right now in this, the foundations of a, one of the houses at an abandoned village called Aspri. And he's sitting there talking to us about how his great great grandpa, you know, used to take his goats into that area to uh, to graze, and there was a wonderful um, case where we were we were in the forest, in a pickup truck, and uh, in the, what I thought was the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden Panio just says, "Ha, huh, Aaron, do you want to do you want to see a pathway and a, and a, a charcoal kiln?" I said, "Oh yeah, absolutely," and so we just we pulled off into this um, forest break, forest fire break and just stopped the car and got out it and just when it made a beeline straight down this beautiful pathway directly to uh, this charcoal kiln. Now to me, and he hadn't been there in at least 15 years, you know, he's older, he's a hard time getting around, but you know, to me it was the middle of nowhere, but to him it was in the middle of everywhere. You know, he knows that landscape so well. Um, Another evidence, more evidence for this attachment to this so supposed empty landscape is um, this picture on the right hand side. This is a church or the foundations of an abandoned church called Ayas Yorios. Um, and you may not be able to see this particularly well, but in this tree there's a scarf which has been, it's a dedicatory scarf, and at the foot of this tree is a plastic icon. So even though this church has been abandoned for a long time, it's still actually used, right? So there, there's, people still have an attachment to these places and they work hard um, to, uh, to get there. So this area, um, the, this area of kind of a Sinu Valley as we call it, is really in the literature, when you come, to, if you look at the tourist literature, it's seen um, in a very different way. 
um, they're really just highlighting the church. That's the most impart, important part. Um, and you can see this in the, in the language used. So you, um, this is a, in the uh, Cyprus Tourist Organization, they have different kind of themed routes that you can take. And this is the one to see the majesty of the Throdos. So the Throdos Mountains are kind of the central mountains um, on the island. There's traditional villages and exquisite painted <coughs> churches. So uh, turn right uh, to the village of Nikitari and into the forest to visit Pania of Asinu, one of the island's most beautiful painted churches set in a secluded opening in the forest and home to some of the finest Byzantine art of the 12th century. So this church is really seen in isolation and the forest, instead of being lived landscape, is a backdrop. Um, and it's not actually integrated at all. And there was a, a survey project, the um, Trollus Archaeological and Environmental Survey Project that I was part of, you know, proved that it was a busy landscape, not just in the recent past, but in the distant past as well. Church doesn't just arise out of nowhere, right? Um, but even this, that even said, the, even the forestry department's literature and their approach is very much about, you know, the forest being a, a great spot to have a picnic. Um, so they have lots of picnics and uh, picnic places and spots to go visit, you know, flora and fauna and, and things like that. But that's, again, um, just it. So it makes me really wonder why, <laughs> you know, why is it that um, the Cyprus's heritage has this huge gap in it? Um, that this, the under, there isn't an understanding of the forest as being anything more than just this backdrop. And certainly, um, villagers like Paniotis Lopas and uh, Christophoros Kosofuru, who is um, in this picture here, is a younger member of the village of Nikitari. They really want to have their heritage of the forest passed on to future generations. And it makes me wonder whether or not is it the f is the um, that ideology that was you know started with the British is that still um, being kind of perpetuated through time. It's just so ingrained um, within the, uh, the narrative that it's just not questioned. Uh, or people, maybe people just don't know about it. So just to conclude, um, in Cyprus you have, on one hand, you have um, rural being this product. It's an alternative to the, the sun and the sea and sand, um, a place to go visit Painted, quaint painted churches, and maybe go for a nice walk in the forest, or um, that side of things. Or is, and then on the other side, you've got um, rural being very much linked to people's identity. So um, the identity of Paniotis and uh, Christophoros, who it's not a place. Um, under, going to the forest is very much about reliving those experiences that they've had in the past. Um, but also those stories have been passed down to them. And um, just as a, as a final kind of story, which kind of embodies a lot of this, um, these ideas, I was uh, talking to Paniotis, because he didn't always live in Nikitari. At some point, he went off um, and did some construction work in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And I asked him, so, you know, why did you come back? Um, and he, he turned to me and he said, the forest is in my blood. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.